Over the uh, past few weeks, we have been spending time with David. And we first found David out in a pasture and God was impressed with this young man. He, he had a heart that was open to God and he, he was humble and he was upright. And so, so God uh, anointed him uh, as the next king. He had Samuel anoint him as the next king. Last week, Billy brought us to the battlefield where we saw David once again. And this time we see David display a, a courageous, trusting, God-defending heart. He, he's ready to stand for the Lord even in the face of a giant. But today we find David somewhere else, somewhere much less impressive. In fact, we find David in a terrible place. Today we find David in a cave. Uh, the cave specifically is the cave of Adalom, uh, and, and in that cave we find David hiding in fear. And so you have to ask yourself, how does someone go from a place of victory over a giant to a place of fearfully hanging out in a cave? How does someone fall so far? How does someone go so low? With that in mind, I'd like you to turn me to Psalm 142. 142, this psalm was written by David while in the cave. That's what the psalm says. I want to read to you the first four verses. Psalm 142, listen to what, G, uh, what David says. <clears throat> he says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who know my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare from me. Look to my right and see, no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. In these words, I hear desperation. In these, in these words, I hear fear. In these words, I hear isolation and loneliness. And let's be honest this morning. David isn't the only one who has ever wound up in a cave of desperation. He's not the only one who's been here. I bet at one time or another, all of us have been in this cave. At one time or another, I bet we've all felt alone. Maybe, maybe we've all felt fearful. Maybe you have even felt desperate at one time or another. I bet we have all wound up where David is in this cave. But how did he get here? I mean, really, how did David get here? This man after God's own heart, this man who slayed a giant, how did David get to this place? Well, some of it was from uncontrollable circumstances. King Saul got very jealous of David. David, if you remember, people were chanting, he has killed his ten thousands, but Saul's only killed his thousands. There, there have been many circumstances that have been driving here, but, but King Saul is one of the main ones because King Saul is so jealous that he attempts to kill David. And he doesn't just attempt to kill him once or twice or three times, but finally on the sixth time, David wakes up and he says, man, I've got to get out of here because he is eventually going to kill me. He is eventually going to kill me. And so on the sixth time, David flees for his life. Now because he is on the run, he cannot take his wife, Michael, with him. Now he's not really too afraid, it appears to me, to leave her behind because she is in fact Saul's daughter. So as he hightails it out of town, he has to leave his wife behind. But I'm sure he's not fearful for her, but he is fearful for for himself, And so he runs over to his mentor, Samuel. Now the problem is Saul's men are chasing him and they quickly show up at Samuel's place and so he has to go on the run again. And by the way, this is the last time David will ever see Samuel. Samuel dies. That's a devastating blow. So as he leaves Samuel... He runs over to his best friend. He tracks his best friend down, Jonathan. Jonathan, the guy who has always been there for him. 
And through tearful goodbyes, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, has to stay with his father. And like Samuel, this is the last time David will ever see Jonathan alive. I want you to think of the loss that David has just sustained in a very short period of time. He can't be with his spouse. His mentor and his best friend, he is separated from really forever or they, they die. And David finds himself completely and utterly alone. I mean, I can see how he could wind up in this cave, this cave of rock bottom, this cave of fear, this cave of depression. I could see how he could be here. Maybe life circumstances haven't always been that good for you either. You know, you know, maybe a spouse has abandoned you and you feel like you are close to this cave. Or, or maybe, has, maybe death has stolen some loved ones from you. Or, or maybe your health is deteriorating. Or, or maybe you just feel like life is conspiring against you. And so you feel like you are at this cave. This lonely, desperate place that David finds himself in. The truth is that David didn't end up in this cave due only to the things outside of his control. He made some terrible choices himself as well that brought him here. You see, while on the run, David found himself in this little town called Nob. And in a panic, he lied to the high priest. He said, you know, Saul sent me over here to get some food and, and get some weapons. And so he took food and he took Goliath's sword from this, from the tabernacle and lied to the high priest. And as a result of his lies, as a result of his forfeiting his integrity, Saul comes to that city, finds that they helped David and he kills every inhabitant that was there. Men, women, and children, all of them. He kills 85 priests who served there. How many of us have hurt others by our sinful choices, by our lack of integrity, by our willingness to lie to protect ourselves or to get what we want? I wonder how many of us have skirted near this cave or have gone into this cave because lust has destroyed our family. Or deceit has meant the loss of a job or the loss of our home. Or the pursuit of popularity destroyed a lifelong friendship. I wonder how many of us like David have made terrible choices, brought us to this cave of despair. But that wasn't his only bad choice. As he continued to run to this cave, he decided that his only option was to go and be with the enemy. And so he went to Gath, the very headquarters of the Philistines, where Goliath came from, his hometown. And when he gets there, he thinks, well, I'll just blend in and no one will know who I am. But they quickly figure out who he is. And because they figure out who he is, he has to pretend to be insane. And so he scratches at the gates and he drools down his beard and he looks around wildly like an animal. He gets rid of his dignity in order to stay safe. Down, down, down he goes until he ends up in a cave. He's lost his position. He's lost the people he loves. He's lost his integrity. He's lost his dignity. And there he is in this cave, hopeless and helpless. And here's where the good news begins. It was in that hopelessness that David figures it out. It is not hopeless, he, he, he is reminded. And it is not hopeless for us either if we find ourselves in this cave. So what does David do to restore 
hope to find his way out of this cave. Well, the first thing he does is he looks upward. He looks upward. David finally turns to God. Now, if you're still in Psalms 142, I want to read to you the next two verses, verses 5 and 6. Psalm 142, verses 5 and 6. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. He has dug this hole so deep that he finally realizes, God, God is my only hope. God is my way out of this. He has been a man who through his entire life had constantly been talking to God, yet during this downward descent, it never mentions one time that he talks to God. It never mentions one time that he consults with the Lord, and he continues to plummet down. And he finally figures out, I must look to God. In fact, one of the first things David does when he comes out of this cave is that he consults God. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, David says this, He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go attack the Philistines? The Lord answers him, Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. He inquires of God. He looks up. He starts to seek the face of the Lord. So as I was preparing for this message, I found this confession of a woman named Esther. I want to read to you, to you her confession. Maybe it'll speak to your heart. It spoke to mine. This is what she said. She said, a few weeks ago, I thought I was going out of my mind. At the time, I didn't realize I was experiencing a form of an anxiety attack Attack. My heart raced with fear as thoughts came to my mind of all the things I hadn't accomplished that day. And the fear of failing the people around me made me want to get sick. I was constantly thinking of all my mistakes, I have, all the mistakes I've made over the years. How I lacked in being a godly woman. How I have, been, how I have not been there for my kids like I know I should have been. It was so paralyzing that I, I couldn't even function at work. And my husband and children suffered the most because I unknowingly shut out the world around me. Then one night out of desperation, I cried out to God for help. I opened my Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. And like blinders being pulled up from my eyes, I could see that I was believing a lie. And I knew those thoughts were from the enemy and not of God. Then the scripture, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus echoed in my mind. I surrendered my feelings of failure to God that day. I gave him my fears and my anxieties and my life was changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Every day when those thoughts would haunt me again, that scripture about condemnation would echo louder and again I would surrender them to God. To God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, this is what Peter tells us. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If you are in a cave of despair, of fear, of loneliness, the first thing you've got to do is turn to God. He cares for you. He's there for you. If you will look to him, he will help you. David looks upward. What about you? What about me? The second thing David did is David looks inward. David looks inward. He admits his failure. He, he comes clean. He fesses up. One of the sons of the high priest survives. And he, and he comes to David while David's still in the cave. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 22, 
<coughs> excuse me, this is what David says. It says, then David said to Abathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul. He says, I knew he was going to rat me out. And I am responsible for the death of your father's whole family. David fesses up. David fesses up. This may be one of the hardest things to do. Admit our bad choices. Let people in on the secret that we are selfish sometimes and our greed and our desires hurt people. But David fesses up. He realizes that he would only be free if he admitted to his guilt. He fesses up. He fesses up. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Coming clean helps heal us. Coming clean helps bring us to a place where we can get rid of the guilt and start to grow with the Lord. Coming clean. Who who amongst us doesn't need that kind of healing? David comes clean and admits his guilt. And then the last thing David does to get out of this cave is he looks outward. He looks outward. As David once again turns to the Lord, as David admits his failure, God once again starts to use him and he begins to send people to David. In fact, in Psalm 142, the last verse, it says, Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. That's exactly what happens. The righteous start gathering around David. God starts sending people to David even while he's at this cave in order for him to help them. It is interesting to me that David's circumstances haven't really changed. Saul is still trying to kill him. He is still living in the cave, but no longer does the cave have a hold on him. His attitude has been changed, and he starts to see the needs of others. See, it's important for us to realize that when we take our eyes off ourselves and start placing them on others, start serving others, start helping others, then we begin to see clearly. Then we escape the cave of desperation. In 1880, James Garfield was elected president of the United States, but after only six months in office, he was shot in the back with a revolver. He never lost consciousness. And at the hospital, the doctor probed the wound with his little finger looking for the bullet. He couldn't find it. So he tried this silver-tipped probe. He still couldn't find the bullet. So they took Garfield back to Washington, D.C. Despite the summer heat, they tried to keep him as comfortable as possible. And he continued to grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And teams of doctors came and tried to locate the bullet, probing his wound over and over and over again. In fact, in desperation, they asked Alexander Graham Bell, who was working on a little device called the telephone, they asked him if he could see or could come and help them find this metal inside the president's body. He came, he sought, and he too failed. President Garfield hung on through July. He hung on through August. But in September, he finally died. The interesting thing is, however, that he did not die from his wound. He died from infection. The repeated probing by his physicians that they thought would help this man eventually killed this man. The same holds true in our life. If we continuously dwell on all that is wrong with us, all that is wrong in the world, 
How life has conspired against us. How we have been given a raw deal. The infection of bitterness and unforgivingness will set up in our lives and eventually cause spiritual death. But if we can turn it all over to God, if we can depend on his strength, if we can admit that our actions have contributed to the cave that we find ourselves in, and if we can start looking for ways that we can help others, then, and only then can we be released to truly live again. Maybe you have been in a cave. I know that I have. Maybe you feel like you're spiraling toward one. Maybe you feel like it's inevitable and you're going to be there. Let me just tell you, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. You can look up to God. You can look inward at yourself and admit your mistakes. And you can look out at people around you that need your help. And God will help you escape the cave of desperation. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning recognizing that you are great. Recognizing that you love us. Recognizing that you are always with us. Recognizing that you can provide for us in ways that we can't imagine or even dream of. And with all that at your disposal, all the power to sustain and create life, we come to you. We ask that you would provide for us, especially for anyone who's dealing with depression or discouragement, anyone who feels like they're in this cave of loneliness or isolation or fear. I pray, Lord, that each of them that all of us would look to you, find our strength in you, realize that you are there with us. Lord, I pray that we'll be honest with ourselves and with you about our failures. And Lord, I pray that we can see beyond our circumstance into the lives of others. And by helping them, loving them, caring for them, we can find freedom from even our own struggles. God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for providing a way out. Thank you for giving a way of escape. Uh, Lord, I pray for each one here, whether they are never been in a cave before, I pray that you will always keep them out. But if anyone has found themselves there or are there right now, Lord, I pray that they would find their strength and encouragement in you this morning. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.